Hello and welcome again to Mid American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener intern, Tanisha Shades Bain. This week we're going to answer some of your questions sent in by our viewers and we're going to cover some other topics, hopefully take some calls, and we've got some great show and tell items today brought in from our panelists. But before we get started with that, we're going to go around and have them introduce themselves to you and tell you a little bit about their specialty. So we'll start with you. Thanks, Nisha. Uh, my name is Kent Miles and I am the owner uh, grower at Illinois Willows. We are a specialty cut flower grower located in western Champaign County. Wonderful. All right, Don. I am Don White. I'm an emeritus professor of plant pathology from the University of Illinois. And while at the University of Illinois, I taught introductory plant pathology, diseases of field crops, and diseases of ornamentals with turf grasses, and did research on corn diseases with emphasis of genetic resistance. After retirement, I got kind of bored, so I became a master gardener, which has been very enjoyable for me. Who would want to follow that guy? <laughs> Go ahead. So I'm Jim Appleby, and I'm an entomologist, retired entomologist at the University of Illinois, so I deal with the insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and flowers. Wonderful. Okay, and everybody brought things to share today, so we're going to start down here with you, Kent. What did you bring in? I brought in some bittersweet. So this is an autumn uh, crop that we grow mm -hmm. and uh, this particular bunch um, I cut this morning so we cut it when the berries before they pop mm -hmm. and we can store it then in our cooler um, and we kind of then bring it out and it usually takes about a day and it starts to pop open it shows the bright orange berry mm -hmm. and then the outside shell um, when it dries it'd be more of a yellow so it brings up a nice autumn color Very so nice. that's kind of what it looks like now it's kind of you know pea-shaped mm -hmm. little uh, berries and then this is the final Very of what pretty. it looks like all opened up so uh, it's a great autumn decor uh, you can use it outside or inside the home and um, we will have this available generally through about the middle of October so do people come in and buy them um, not arranged to make their own wreaths right. and make their own yeah. decor? Yeah. Wow. So we will uh, we sell the bunches at mm -hmm. the Urbana's Market uh, at the Square. Mm -hmm. And then we also will make wreaths out of this. And when we make wreaths, um, we'll use it at this stage. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot easier to use than sure. opened up and dried. So They're very uh, pretty. Makes a nice fall decor. Yes. Definitely. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. All right, Don, we're going to go to you. Yes. Now yours is a picture. So walk us through. A group of pictures. Oh, sorry, a group of pictures. So what do we see in here? This is fairy ring. Uh, what happens is you get fungi uh, that will actually start to grow on a tree stump or a buried piece of wood and they'll grow out in a circle away from that tree stump or wood and then uh, in the summer, if it's real wet, you'll have a circle of mushrooms called a fairy ring. Now the fairy ring has a lot of fairy tales to go with it. <laughs> if uh, you go out at night and make six trips around, you're going to see fairies. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you like to do that. <laughs> and if uh, you get caught in the middle, something bad's going to happen. If you touch one, something bad's going to happen. But if you'll notice here, I have the arrow. There's a little bit of a, a brown stunted area of grass, and I'll show you why here in a minute. Next slide. This is more of that same ring. It was a pretty good size when it- I was gonna uh, say, that looks well, pretty it, big. It came out from a, where there was a honey locust that had been cut down, oh, I'd say 10 or 15 years before these happened. Next one. Here's a smaller ring. This is one I saw uh, about three weeks ago, and there had been a tree there at one time. If you look very closely here, what you'll see, the, the grass is a little bit darker mm -hmm. around the fairy ring because what happens, the fungus also produces uh, various things like uh, various growth hormones and it breaks down the thatch in the grass, which releases nitrogen. So it can actually make a lighter colored ring. Next one. And here we have, uh, I dug this up. This is the white growth in here is the fungus mycelium. That'll be on the test. And mycelium is just a vegetative growth of the fungus. Next one. And here's more mycelium. Next one. Here we have the mushroom looking down from above. Nice pretty white mushroom, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look from the bottom, next slide. 
you'll see this one has a skirt around it or a ring. Now this mushroom is poisonous. A lot of the mushrooms that you will see in fairy rings are poisonous. Now, where, Master Gardener intern, oh, no. would you go to <laughs> find edible mushrooms? Well, we have them all around our property. They grow near dying or dead wood. And where uh, would you find them? Okay. Uh, the produce counter at the grocery <laughs> store. <laughs> And that way, you're sure that they're edible, and you're not going to get in trouble. Oh, you won't no. pick the wrong one. <laughs> okay? Got the wrong answer on that one. Yes. Um, so is that one specific type of mushroom that grows in a fairy ring, or? No, you get, all, you get a number of different ones, uh, some more common than others. And occasionally, you'll have puff balls, mm -hmm. great big white mm -hmm. circles. I know where there's one of those that I drive by a lot of times on the way into campus well so far i haven't gotten into any trouble picking mushrooms in the woods so <laughs> yeah but that's the problem was so far so far so far okay all right now what did you bring jim well i'd like to talk a little bit about bird feeders i, I know many of you viewers are uh, like to feed birds the problem when you feed birds is that um, the raccoons and squirrels get up the bird feeder and destroy the feeders so if we could show that first, uh, well, let, let's show that first slide. And uh, that's my bird feeder, and, you, and it's made of a PVC pipe. And so the animals like squirrels and possums and raccoons can't climb up a PVC pipe. And if you make it like I've, I've described in my handout, what I've done is to make a handout that will be appearing on our internet. Yes, it'll be on the Mid-American Gardener uh, website. We'll have it on the website and on our Facebook Yeah, in a so days. rather than to talk a long time about the bird feeder and how to construct one, I made this up and it's going to be on our internet site. So I think that will be helpful to you. Uh, some One of the feeders that I attach on that PVC pipe is this one uh, that's a uh, feeder that um, actually the Baltimore Orioles just love it. And if we could show that next uh, picture of the uh, slide of the Baltimore Orioles. There it is. Oh. You know, this, this summer I had three pairs of Baltimore Orioles. They, they start appearing about the, uh, about the latter part of April. And uh, they like grape jam. And they're very particular about what quality of grape, grape jam. Oh, <laughs> they're choosy. They're very choosy. I, I made a test where I put two cups of the more expensive Welch's and uh, Smucker's jam, and then two cups of the cheap store brand. Don't you know they gobbled <laughs> up the expensive well. jam, but they did not feed very frequently on the cheap store brand. So uh, now they all get uh, the, uh, the more good expensive. Stuff, huh? But uh, these feeders are quite nice. I like one that a feeder like this. You can put the uh, jam in these little containers like mm -hmm. that, and then they don't get rain on. Because you know, if you got jam out there, it's going to get sure. rain on and dilute. And then, then these you can buy very cheaply. These are the ant guards, because if you got jam in the in the bottom of this, you're going to have ants coming down the thing and getting into your jam. So put an ant bar. You fill this up with water, oh. and then it will prevent the ants getting into the jam. So everything works out really well. And I think if if you viewers uh, read that article I have that's going to be on the internet, I think it will be helpful to you. I, I love birds, and uh, it's really important that we feed the birds, particularly in the wintertime. This, so. When you were talking about this, it reminded me of like a moat. Yeah, yeah, it is. That they can't cross. Right, they can't cross. <laughs> they don't like to cross over the water, so. Okay, and uh, that document will be available in a couple of days, so today's Thursday. I would say by Friday, Saturday, you'll be able to find that, um, or early next week on our website. Okay, before we go to another round of questions, we're going to go to the phone. Norma in Mattoon has a question about bugs on milkweed. Norma, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, go ahead. I just noticed that I have a distinctly the orange and black bugs, mm -hmm. and they're on the pod, and I don't know whether those are good or bad. The panelists are nodding, so I think they've got an answer for you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it, it's the milkweed bug. It's actually, <laughs> it's a true bug. You know, a lot of 
bugs, they're all insects, but not all insects are bugs. This is actually a true bug, the milkweed bug, and they will actually feed on the seeds of the milkweed. So, you know, there, there's enough seeds to go around. But, but they're just a curious, interesting insect. Very pretty, I think. Okay. All right. Let's, take, uh, let's do another round of questions. Uh, Kent, we got one for you. Mm -hmm. Aunt B. So she wrote in, yeah. uh, what is this blue flower? The plant has feathery type little leaves. And then she says, we enjoy the show so much. Thanks for any information you might be able to provide. Okay. Well, what uh, the photo is, is Larkspur, which is a common uh, kind of a cottage type uh, cut flower and perennial uh, that you generally see in a lot of cottage gardens. And uh, it comes in several colors. It is a perennial, it, they will reseed. Um, you can use them as a cut flower. You would want to harvest them generally when they are about halfway blooming up the, st the spike. And if you want to go ahead, they also make a wonderful dried flower. Hmm. So you wanna, at that time, uh, cut them when they're about three quarters of the way up. The blossoms are open. And uh, like I said, they will reseed. Uh, so you'll have a continual mm -hmm. patch of larkspur. So now, will they expand and, and get thicker and wider? Or they, they will. They will. Yeah, depending on how the seeds are dispersed. Gotcha. Okay. So generally, um, the fall now is a good time to plant the seed. Uh, it's one of those uh, cool uh, perennials that will winter over. It'll form a little rosette. Uh, generally, it takes anywhere from 15 to 25 days to germinate and it'll form a little rosette this fall and it'll stay like that through the winter. And if we get good snow cover, that'll help it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then next spring, uh, you should start seeing blossoms uh, first of June. Okay. So. And it seems like, so that'll, that'll flower and bloom all throughout right. the summer? Yeah, off and on. So as you cut it, the, the uh, main flower, uh, it'll send up some basil stems. Mm -hmm. So you'll get a continual bloom nice. for about a month or month and a half. It looked like a, it was a beautiful plant. Yeah. So, okay. All right, Don, we're going to go to you. Yes, I brought along uh, another show and tell here. This is tip light on juniper. Okay. And what will happen, you'll see that the tips of uh, the plant, the tissue is dead. And this is Fomopsis tip light. What essentially happens here is this fungus can only attack young succulent tissue and the spores require quite a bit of water to germinate. So what'll happen is in the spring, when you get new growth, if it's wet, the fungus will uh, germinate, penetrate into new growth and kill the new growth. And the difficulty with this is that what'll happen is you buy a house or you build a house, you put out juniper plants in the front, they look great. You put some trees also out, eventually the trees will shade the juniper now all at once, the juniper is in shaded environment, the foliage doesn't dry out as quick, so the fungus has more of an opportunity to penetrate and cause this. The good news is there's quite a bit of difference in susceptibility and there's a lot of resistant varieties. Now intuitively, you'd think, well, I can control this pretty easily by just cutting off the dead tissue, right? And you see that in a lot of popular press, Dr. Google will tell you that a lot, but that is not true because what happens, this daggone thing also grows on bark tissue. Mm. So the only way to really control it is spray fungicides and make sure you get the bark. Gotcha. So. Now to go along with that, um, we've got a question from yes. a lady named Mary. <clears throat> She's got a 20 foot evergreen and it's dying. Next to that is a very large old wild rose bush. It didn't bloom and she wants to know if that is associated at all. I doubt that it's associated and what would have been nice, Mary, <laughs> is if you would have uh, sent a photograph so we know what you were talking about. I'd like to know about that evergreen and what it is. If it's a blue spruce, it's going to die with uh, needle disease. If it's a red pine or Austrian pine, uh, eventually it's going to die. And if you're, you start thinking about evergreens, uh, white pines are still pretty good. There's a, a lot of the... Uh, I like cypress, you know, mm -hmm. it may not please everybody. And there's a couple of the fir trees are good in Norway spruce. 
I don't think it bothered your rows. Would like to see the rows. If you want to know what the problem is, you're going to have to show us the plant. And if you really want to know what killed the rose, I'd suggest sending it to a plant disease clinic so they can actually isolate from the tissue and identify the pathogen. Okay. So Mary's got some work to do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. All get right. The, get the phone camera out. There you go. Or get your granddaughter or somebody to do there it. There you go. That's better. Yeah. Just have somebody do it for you. Okay. Uh, Jim, we've got one for you from Mike. He says, how can we get rid of cicada killer wasps and make sure they never return? Our grass continues oh. to look like Swiss cheese. Ah, oh. and that's one of my favorite insects. <laughs> uh, I mean, Well, I, I'm sure you can go get them. I, I just hate to uh, <laughs> see them uh, destroyed. Uh, so I would say to Mike, you know, the cicada killers like dry, sunny areas, and even in, in bare soil. So if I had a lawn and I wanted to, to discourage them to come to the lawn, I would get a thatch remover mm. and get the thatch out of there. And then I would, um, uh, I would then uh, get some seed, good quality seed, reseed the area. And you might want to do that this fall, reseed it. And then once the uh, grass starts coming up, the new grass, then fertilize it lightly. And then next spring, really put some fertilizer on that and keep keep watering it because those insects do not like wet lawns so they want, they like a dry well well um, you know area and, and cut the lawn high so it's really high mm -hmm. high lawn uh, high grass rather so I think if you follow those procedures you, you'll discourage the the uh, things getting in there but uh, the, you know they're really interesting insects and, and very gentle I mean the I don't, I've only known one person that got stung, and Phil Nixon told me that, that somebody, bare feet, they tramped mm. on one. Other than that, they're very gentle insects. The females do have a stinger, but they, they just don't use they it. They prefer not. They prefer not, <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, we've got another call. We've got Venus Indicator. She has a question about zinnias. Venus, are you there? Yes, good evening. Hi, go ahead. Uh, uh, my zinnias. I've planted them every year, but this time it's kind of weird for me because one stem and the leaves are starting to turn white, and then it, as the next leaves is turning white as well, and then the next one that is ready to kind of bloom, every leaf turns white. Mm. And the flowers that is ready to bloom is also white holding the flowers. Sounds to me like a fungus problem yeah. on the foliage. Uh, we've had a little bit of that this year, uh, depending on the amount of rainfall. Uh, this last big storm we had, mm -hmm. uh, we're starting to see a little bit of that now. Um, so it could be a combination, you know, more of an environmental that is causing the yeah. discoloration. Um, my personally opinion would be to, uh, if you're not cutting your zinnias, to bring them in and enjoy them, uh, go ahead and start cutting them. Uh, we cut zinnias back really h hard, so then we get a lot of more new stems. So that's what I would suggest probably. Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to go to line three now. Jeff in Onarga with a question about white powdery disease on melons. <laughs> Jeff, are you there? Yes. Okay, uh, go ahead. I was, something was killing the vines for my Crenshaw melons. I was wondering what I could do to, to stop the white powdery, I don't know if it's a fungus or what, but I, I tried vinegar and that didn't work. So I was wondering if there was something I should do. Be nice. Yeah, I'm nice. <laughs> it's, it's, vinegar oh, is not a labeled pesticide, so don't use it. Uh, <laughs> actually, it sounds like powdery mildew. Powdery mildew, the fungus uh, requires high humidity to germinate and penetrate the leaf. And we've certainly had the high humidity, so this has been a good year for powdery mildew diseases. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is it doesn't really kill a lot of leaf tissue, it just shades the leaf. Now, if you want to control powdery mildew, there's a number of fungicides that you can put on and it'll control it, but generally speaking, uh, on melon, I don't think I'd worry about controlling it because you're not going to interfere with that much photosynthesis with the powdery mildew. Okay. 
All right, Jeff, in a, no, no, we just talked to him. The call that we had on the line just disappeared. Okay, well, let's do another round of questions then. Kent, this was uh, for you. Loretta wants to know how far she should cut back her hydrangeas. Okay, um, it would be nice to know what type of hydrangea you're speaking of uh, because there are uh, several different varieties and types of uh, hydrangea and they're all a little bit different on how you would cut them back. Uh, the, what's pictured here on the screen is the what we call a traditional mop head and we I personally would wait until in the spring and see what part leafs out. If you're leafing out uh, don't cut them. If it, you're not getting any leaves on the stem go ahead and cut those back and when you do cut them back uh, look at the part that you cut and if it looks like it's dried out or it's brown uh, you're okay. So you just want to cut them back. Uh, this particular one pictured um, looks like okay there's the, uh, your traditional mop head. Um, limelight hydrangea is a hydrangea that is more of a conical shaped blossom mm -hmm. and those bloom on new wood. So those uh, you would generally want to prune back. Uh, we do ours in uh, March uh, still in the middle of kind of early spring, late winter. Uh, before anything leaves out, we trim them back. And those you can go back pretty hard with them. So kind of depending on what type of hydrangea. Um, the ones, mop heads, you kind of bloom on old wood. So um, just depends on just which depends ones. on what type. Okay. So a photograph here might have helped. Okay. But you did give some good advice yes. for both. Right. So great. Okay. Don, uh, Kathy has a question about tulip tree. The tulip tree we planted two years ago had winter kill on its east side this spring, so we cut it down. Since then, several shoots have grown that are now five feet tall. Is this a good plant to keep or should we remove it? I think that's, that's very debatable. It kind of depends on just what you really want to do. I th really think you're going to have multiple shoots. And the problem is I don't know about what's underground and what, what the shoots connect to. Uh, you're probably going to have to try, if you want to do it, you can try to chain, train one shoot and make that into a tree. If it was me, i just dig the whole thing out and start all over. And I think that way uh, you get rid of whatever rotted tissue you have underground that might influence eventually the, the tree that's there. So I plant another one and uh, just call it done deal. You know, people get so bent out of shape when you tell them to start over or dig yeah. something out or, or, you know, get rid of it because people get like attached to what they've got. But well, if you're in love with that plant, you can go <laughs> ahead and just prune it down to, to one stem, I guess, and keep it if you want to. That's up to you. I'm just telling you what I would do. I would dig it all out, get rid of it and put a new one in. And really, this is getting pretty close to a good time to start planting. Yeah. Uh, woody trees because then that way they're going to have the rest of the fall mm -hmm. to put out roots in the spring and that way you're going to get a good established plant out of it. Okay, great advice. All right, Donette in Springfield with a question about picking pumpkins. Donette, are you there? Yes, thank you. Um, I have some baby pumpkins, the, the uh, ornamental kind, and they're really gr growing um, and I think they've grown probably as far as they're going to, but when should I pick them so they would be able to, you know, be around for Halloween and Thanksgiving? Is there a certain time to pick them? Well, I don't know exactly when, but uh, those of us in the Master Gardener uh, Children's Garden <laughs> picked ours uh, last week because the bugs had eaten the heck out of the foliage anyway, mm -hmm. and we picked them and whenever we've done that, uh, picked them this early, they've done rather well. Mm -hmm. It's surprised how they'll last. So I'd go ahead and pick them now. Okay. All right, Jim, we're going to do one more question for you. We've got a couple minutes left. Jeff wants to know about a misshapen pear. He says, I have an old pear tree that has only had one good year for fruit. Most years, the majority of the fruit is small and very misshapen. What is going on? Well, we have a couple insects that attack uh, fruit, the apples as well as the pears, and those are the uh, the weevils, uh, particularly the uh, plum curculio and the apple curculio, and uh, they attack them 
just the very, very tiny fruits when they're after a petal fall, the petals, you know, fall from the tree and the, after the blossoms, it's the blossoms, petals. When, that fall, when they fall, that's when these insects become active and they start piercing, they put their mouth parts in these little fruits. And so then you get the dimpling and then they'll feed, these insects will feed the rest of the season. So you get all these dumpled fruits. I think if I were you, I would search around to find a company that sells bonide products. That's spelled B-O-N-I-D-E. It's a company that uh, that has really a good selection of, um, of sprays for the homeowner. And so shop around, find out what company nearby will sell bonide products. And bonide has a formulation called, it's called Complete Fruit Tree Spray. And if you follow the directions on the label, and you have to, you know, you, you can't get just with one spray. If you really want to have this perfect fruit like you find in the grocery store, you really need to get several sprays on. So follow the directions on that label. And I think if you follow the directions, you won't have a problem with these simple fruits. I wrote all that down that you were talking about because our pears and apples at my house look exactly like the ones yeah, that were up there. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm gonna definitely... They're a little tiny insect. I mean, not shouldn't be too tiny, but they have a very long mouth part weevils gotcha. and they insert those long mouth parts into the fruit and then once they do that that area then becomes dimpled 